Welcome to the podcast where passion and purpose collide. We are on a mission to interview women and the occasional token man about how their passion and purpose have collided to create healthy relationships and profitable businesses. I'm Elizabeth Denham, publisher of the Franchise Woman magazine, and I'm here with Rebecca Monet, president and chief scientist of Zorical Profiles. We start off the show each week um, with our roses and thorns of the week, our highs and lows. So, Rebecca, start us off. What was your what was your rose and thorn this week? I love thinking about this idea of roses and thorns. So I don't know about you, but uh, every once in a while, I just get in a funk, and I can't put my finger on what causes that funk. It could be overwhelm. I I didn't get enough sleep. I don't know what it is, but I was in a crazy funk yesterday and I was working, working, working and I'm finally like, I'm in a funk. I got to get myself <laughs> out of this funk or, it's, you know, people are going to see that I'm in, in this kind of bizarre place in my head. And what's so cool is I instantly thought, who can I call? Who amongst my friends can I call that would help me shift this mindset, this, this funk that I was in? And I think this is a, a lot why I love franchising. Uh, in the world of franchising, uh, people really come alongside one another. They want you to succeed. Even if you're a competitor, they want you uh, to succeed. So I reached out on, on Facebook to Robert Addy. He's with Action Coach. And I said, I'm in a funk. Can, <laughs> I, <laughs> can I talk to you? And within minutes, he's, he's calling me. And 30 minutes later, I'm feeling just fine. And then <laughs> later that evening, I, uh, another good friend I had reached out to me, called, and we spent about an hour together kind of pulling the pieces to get uh, a part of where possibly uh, the funk started. Cause I'm, you know, I'm analytical. I, I, I gotta know what the why and how this got created. So having a friend that can lift your spirits and then having another friend that helps you dissect and figure out how in the world you got in that funk. I just, I just felt so blessed. So my, my thorn was, I was funky and my <laughs> rose was, I'm so blessed to have such incredible friends. I love that. I love it. I love it. And that's um, kind of leads into my rose too. But I'm going to tell you my thorn first because I have two different ones this time because I find that often they're the same. Um, but this time I'm going to talk about the thorn of having to recreate the logo for the Franchise Woman magazine um, because people gripe that it was a sexist logo, which I thought was kind of funny, you know, it's a little body shape, um, which I thought was very vague non-sexual it was just a shape it wasn't a specific shape it wasn't a sexy woman or a skinny woman or anything but um not wanting to have that be a, a focal point we, we went ahead and changed it and so now i'm going through the process of trying to change it out on everything which is just you know time consuming and i like the new logo it's a really cool like edgy face um, and i think it does focus more on the head space than the body space uh, which yeah. is what we want to do in the franchise woman magazine but I still feel like it was two men telling me that it was a sexist logo. It's kind of funny. Well, there um, you have it. There you have it. <laughs> so um, my rose, though, is sort of like yours. It, I have a personal writing piece I do called the, uh, the Struggle because I've had a lot of struggle in my life and finding the gift in that and kind of finding the why. It's like if I haven't gone through this and I couldn't be a resource for somebody for that. Um, I think my divorce helped me help my kids through the struggles that they've had with having four parents and you know dealing with all the mechanics of that but but this week it was about you know we're going through the struggle of the pandemic and we you know marketing money goes down um and the magazine you know was on the upswing since the beginning of it and it's been doing great and um and then things slow down and so i think the gift of that struggle and frustration is that during this time i've made more relationships i focused on how can i get people's messaging out what can I do to help people, let people know they're still there? Um, who can I do things with that are going to be productive, not only for me professionally, but personally and, and fulfilling? And, you know, this podcast with you is one of those gifts struggle. It kind of came out of that time of, of figuring it out, being creative and finding creative ways to continue to push forward. So you are part of my rose this week. 
<laughs> I'm so glad I could be something for you. And you're so right. Struggle um, creates innovation and it creates muscle and has us have to think differently. So if we can embrace it rather than see it as a pain in the rumpus or in this case, a thorn, uh, right. it's, amazing. it's amazing what can come out of it. Well, it is. And one thing that gets me through struggle, um, sometimes you don't know what the gift is when you're in the midst of it. Mm -hmm. um, I have a struggle right now. I'm not exactly sure what the gift will be, but at my age and my experience, I know there will be a gift. So embracing what you're going through as hard as it may be gets you through that. And if you, if you deny it and avoid it, you don't get the gift. Yeah. So I think that, you know, if, even if you don't know what it is right this second, you will know. At some yeah. point in hindsight, you will, you will know how that benefited you, how you grew, how you were able to help somebody else. So I, I think sometimes just having the faith that it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. To anticipate something good is going to come out of it versus seeing it as a thorn, knowing somewhere amongst the thorns, there's got to be a rose. And that excitement that says, someday I'm going to discover it. It might be in a tiny little bud form right now, but it's going to come. So just, just having that mindset really makes a mm -hmm. difference. It really does, because it can get you through those funky times when you just feel like everything is weighing you down. Yeah. So those were good ones this week. I'm excited. I, I love the conversation. Um, um, but now it is time to bring in our guest. I'm going to let her in. Would you like to um, tell us who we have this week? Absolutely. So I'm actually very excited to introduce our guest today. Uh, she's Ricky Wilkins, Senior Franchise Developer with Decalash. So Ricky has done many things in her life, often going against the grain and playing in the Boy Scout. But the common thread throughout everything she's done is her passion for promoting a product, service, or even an ideal. She's always been a bit of a performer. Even as an 11 year old child, sh you know, shaking and stammering, she proposed to her small town city council that they needed to open a dog shelter. It was her first sale and obviously many since then. So welcome, Ricky. Hello, pleasure <laughs> to be with you. We're so excited to have you. Um, you know, do you mind telling us a little bit more about this dog shelter and what made an 11 year old girl get up the courage to to speak in front of the the city council and and advocate for a dog shelter what made you do that well i i suppose it was a passion i was always the kid that uh was feeding you know stray dogs behind the garage sneaking food out of the house to kind of uh keep them going and I was the kid that when they had puppies would take the little puppies and go around and knock on doors and try to find them homes Aww. and we, we uh, moved to a bigger town when I was about 10 and um, still there were a lot of stray dogs but I, I my, the way our house was configured I couldn't hide them anywhere <laughs> so <laughs> I had said to my father you know, somebody ought to do something about this. These poor things have no place to go and there's no what, you know. And uh, he probably listened to me talk about that several times. And he said, well, I'll tell you what, the next time there's a council meeting, let's go see if uh, you can do something about that. Oh. <laughs> I <laughs> never dreamed that he would put me in that position, but that's exactly what happened and we went to the council meeting and I was scared and nervous and I was probably close to tears but I managed to spit out that there needed to be a place for these dogs to go and they actually uh, did a vote in front of me and they agreed to build a slab with a fence around it but the deal was I had to come after school every day and change the water and make sure they had food and scoop up the you know what the poo poo mm -hmm. so it was not only my first sale it was my first job <laughs> it was a paid job but again it's that psychic income that somehow makes it okay 
Yeah. Well, and, and right. talking about your psychic income, you said, you know, financial income is excellent in your bio. You mentioned this, and I love this part, but the psychic income makes a big impact on you. So fast forward to today and what you're doing, um, and especially as a woman in, in industry, what is, what defines your psychic impact? Well, um, for me, there's such a reward in helping somebody uh, find their path. You know, uh, typically mm -hmm. candidates come to us. We're uh, more fortunate if we have a spot on profile <laughs> that comes <laughs> with <laughs> us. <laughs> but it's a way to, you know, kind of help them uh, tell you what they're looking for, what their dreams are, what their goals are, their challenges. Um, and then, you know, talking about this process that we have, taking them through it, learning more about them. Um, it's, I mean, the, the financial reward is, is great, of course, but the fact that we get to help somebody find their future and be yeah. that excited and that motivated to take that step, and it may be the first time they've ever done anything entrepreneurial, um, but the fact that we can kind of scoop them up and surround them with all these systems and processes and give them the comfort that they can dare to now do uh, what they want, to follow their dreams, uh, wow. it's extremely rewarding. Wow. So that's my psychic income. <laughs> the psychic income is a fulfillment of seeing others be able to dream bigger and to know that those dreams are supported in this case by Deca Lash um, and giving them a way to express themselves and create income and um, be a part of, like you said, uh, a pack, their tribe. Our it, wolf it, pack. The wolf pack. <laughs> yeah. We have a saying in our company, uh, it's, uh, we are changing lives one lash at a time. And that sounds rather bold, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It is rather bold, but we believe it because we've got this great business model that can be very profitable, that can position somebody to be an owner operator or perhaps take a semi-passive role. Um, so we're changing the lives of our owners. We've got um, a product, you know, we have women coming into our studios and they walk out feeling beautiful and empowered and more confident, smiling. Um, so we're literally changing their lives yeah. and then we're also changing the lives of our lash artists because we're literally giving them a profession that they can be proud of. Our training is the best in the industry, but we're not just teaching them how to be a lash technician. We're teaching them about business. We're teaching them about customer service and uh, how to be a brand ambassador. And we're respecting their goals and re we're rewarding their achievements and we're bringing them into this wolf pack. They're employees, so they're not under the crunch of being in, uh, you know, a contractor, which is really the case a lot in the beauty industry. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also helping them be part of something bigger than themselves. And we get so excited when we hear that somebody's bought a new car or mm -hmm. put a down payment on a house. We yeah. celebrate that because they can earn a really good income with a career path. So it's, uh, again, more of that reward. Yeah. It's interesting. You, you mentioned that um, in the beauty industry, uh, the, the retention of employees is tough. And so for Decalash to, to take this approach, that this is going to be a career for the lash stylist i don't know what the proper name is so forgive lash me artists thank you <laughs> <laughs> lash artist 
that they know that they can have a career and that this will be their tribe for a lifetime and mm -hmm. that they can, that will lead them to greater financial freedom, the ability to buy the house that you talked about or that new car. It is indeed a career path for the lash artists and then it's a business opportunity for uh, the franchisee. Uh, and it's got to be, like you said, that psychic reward has got to be huge for all mm -hmm. concerned. And we uh, have 86 open studios now. So we've even had situations where a lash artist lived in Pittsburgh and decided they wanted to move to Phoenix. Good idea. And <laughs> went from one lash artist, uh, what one uh, Deca Lash studio to another. So, uh, yeah, it's exciting. So we, in terms uh, of, uh, go ahead, sorry. I was going to say we do a lot of things for women. I mean, when I th always think about October, we get out the pink eyelashes um, <laughs> with, with the Susan uh, G. Coleman organization. We have, uh, they call them uh, cosmeceuticals. These are uh, cosmetics, uh, serums like that can help uh, a cancer patient. Mm -hmm. uh, we can help them build and strengthen their lashes. And, you know, as they start to come back, we can actually give them lash extensions. And again, it's about them feeling, um, you know, beautiful again. Mm -hmm. or giving them some self-esteem again after going through something, you know, so traumatic. Sounds like a little thing, but it really is it's a big, big deal. It's a big deal. It's a Especially, big deal. Mm -hmm. Especially for women, uh, where our, our hair and uh, anything to do with hair, including <laughs> lashes, really is mm -hmm. sort of our crowning glory, right? It's a, it's a wonderful way to express our femininity and and uh, so someone who's gone through that kind of struggle mm -hmm. to be able to get a part of that back, um, it's got to be, yeah, it's like getting yeah, a part of your identity been, back. Yeah. yeah, a little more sense of normalcy as, it's try, as you're trying mm -hmm. to recover from something traumatic. Um, in terms of your, what you were just talking about, this being at your path for your um, last artist, but also for your business center and, and the history you have in, in business, same in male dominated industry going into more female led businesses and then over the years talk to us about what that would have meant to you to have that kind of support i'm assuming most of your owners are women right um a lot of them are but sometimes mm -hmm. we'll have uh male owners we have a lot of people from the finance industry because the business can be so profitable uh, mm -hmm. We have a lot of um, what we call power couples, husband-wife team. Um, we have people who just want to build wealth and they put a manager in place. We have people that want to diversify their portfolios. Maybe they own other franchises uh, and now they want to, you know, add something else to, to the portfolio. So we have a little bit of everything. Um, I have been in male-dominated businesses most of my career, uh, where in long ago enough where there weren't many women. There were very few women. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, um, it seems like a, the right road for me to have been on to end up here. <laughs> it's <laughs> glorious. <laughs> We're, tell, tell us more I mean, about that. that. The women in the franchise world, I just so enjoy working with them. Yeah. Well, and talk about your experience growing up, basically growing up in business through well, having those, those male-dominated industries and then transiting to female. And then how does that inform your leadership now? So when I started in sales, it was all men. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I, uh, I needed to work. I had a young family. I was a single parent. And I thank all of those men that I worked with because they paid me well. They promoted me. Um, but when I did finally get to a place I got into healthcare, there were a lot of women in that world. 
-hmm. And I was so shocked um, by the fact that they didn't take very good care of one another. Mm -hmm. There seemed to be a lot of uh, competition, I think, uh, a lot of backbiting, a lot of uh, just manipulating and, and literally being cruel to one another. And I never quite understood it, but I think I do understand it. And maybe it has something to do with the fact that, you know, when we grew up, we didn't do team sports. We didn't yeah. know about teams. It seems like everything we did, you were a cheerleader. It really wasn't a team effort. It was an individual effort. So I think a lot of women take uh, competition personally. Mm. And it really is just a fact of business. And one day you might be the winner and one day the next person might be the winner. But um, as I went on, I, you know, after I left the healthcare world, I went on to more male dominated industries again. And like I said, I appreciate everything they've done for me. When I got to into franchise sales though, that's when I really connected with um, women in, in a more genuine way. I think that the women in franchising, this isn't their first or second or third job. Mm -mm. They've been somewhere. They've had some experiences. Um, I think they know better how to take care of each other. Yeah. And I, uh, that's, that's also been a reward for me. I, I totally agree. I come from a similar kind of background working in male dominated uh, industries and spaces myself and coming through that and to see in the world of franchising uh, that one woman to another doesn't see each other as competition and even if they do they understand that co-opetition collaborating oh i love that word <laughs> so it's kind of i can compete with you but i can also collaborate with you and we'll both benefit and the franchise model in general is one where you understand another decalash could be a few miles down the road and there is benefit in that decalash Huge being there. down the road so i'm not competition with them in fact she or they um allows me greater brand recognition by being down the road. So the business model in and of itself is one that understands the importance of others, right? Mm -hmm. That we're not fighting each other. Let's, let's cooperate. Let's <laughs> collaborate. Let's, you know, absolutely. We've right. got bigger fish to fry than to, to hurt each other. Right? Yes, absolutely. So I think we've come a ways. We certainly have. We certainly have. So I, uh, if, I'm sorry, go ahead, Elizabeth. I was just going to say, in terms of advice for women coming up now, um, what, what would you tell them differently than you would tell yourself back when you were coming up? Because I think times have changed. I've always had this idea too that with fewer women in leadership, there are fewer opportunities for women to lead and therefore competition is increased and maybe that plays into that guiding type of behavior. Mm -hmm. But as leadership roles have opened up for women, I think that is changing too. And I think the co-opetition attitude is, is becoming much more appealing because there is more room for everyone. So what do you think in terms of, of a, a girl graduating college or a, a, a girl, a woman looking for a franchise opportunity? What kind of advice would you give a younger business person, woman? Well, I've always sort of had a, a theory about um, excellence. And mm -hmm. I would say, you know, it, it goes back to that saying, when you steal from one source, uh, it's plagiarism. When you steal from every source, it's research. So be a researcher, yeah. listen, absorb, Put it in your back, back pocket, um, save it, because you're going to be able to pull it out and use it someday. And if you just keep doing that throughout your career, I, I think you can't help but be successful. Yeah. I love that. And I completely agree. I've got a, a daughter graduating from college next week, actually. And um, she's a journalist. And one of the things she struggled with was criticism, you know, because online everybody can say anything. Oh, yeah. And 
my advice to her was if you've done a good job, if you know you've done your research, if you know you've done the job right, then stand up straight and hold your head high and defend yourself. Like, I think that when you know you've done excellent work and you've done the research, there's no reason to, to doubt yourself at that point. And, and doesn't it come back to betting on yourself? Yeah. Right. You know, at the end of the day, whatever anybody says or does, bet on yourself, follow your instinct. Yeah. Yeah. But at the same time, as you both pointed out, it's being open to uh, feedback, what you're calling research. What do you think? What have you read? What have you observed? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's taking feedback in one form or another and then applying it to our own lives. Uh, and ultimately it is, it, it is betting on ourselves, you know, not in a vacuum, not in a vacuum no. or with ignorance, no. but uh, trusting our own instincts, uh, and at the same time being open to feedback. Mm -hmm. That's what I think is so wonderful about franchising, because we've got all the systems and processes around somebody, you know, so that if they'll just follow them, you know, there's a very, very, very strong chance that they will be successful. But yet, they still have to bet on themselves enough to take mm -hmm. that step forward. And of course, that's what we're doing. We're giving them that, that confidence and that assurity that we'll be there for them. So exciting. So exciting. Yeah, it's sometimes we need the faith of another in us. Mm -hmm. And that's what Deca Lash kind of gives is I, I believe in you. I trust you. I know you have it within you uh, until you can say, okay, I, I, I can do this. <laughs> well, and I think that speaks too to um, something that you also wrote in your bio about your core values. And if anything ever conflicts with a policy, you revert to those core values. So talk to us a little bit about that, because I think that speaks to the atmosphere probably of your work environment, the way that you conduct sales, that kind of thing. I think it's huge and, and important. It's an amazing culture that I have found myself in with this company. And it is truly one of the reasons why it was easy for me to make the move to Decalash. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a company filled with people who are passionate and caring and confident and have long and successful uh, backgrounds in franchising. So we like to say we're a franchisor for franchisees. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, we all belong to this wolf pack. <laughs> where it's one for all, all for one. We have core values. We have carefully, you know, uh, made a list of them, the things that we think are most important. And while we certainly have processes and procedures uh, in the company, just as any would, if there's ever a question about any of them, we revert to core values. So it's about being authentic, being in relationships, um, having each other's back. Uh, we also like to have a lot of fun. <laughs> that's so important. That's important as well. <laughs> yeah. Play hard. Work Play hard. hard. <laughs> right? Right. It does always come back to those values and to have them so clearly articulated within Deca Lash, a prospective franchisee can say, I share those values, I want to live those values, or if it's not a good fit, which sometimes, you know, someone can't, they don't want to be part of a wolf pack, they want to be lone wolves, right? Yes. Uh, this would be the right fit. So that's we even have a, uh, uh, a franchisee uh, committee that are elected by the franchisees, um, so they have a voice always, um, they have a constituency that, that, you know, they can be involved in any of our conversations. We're very collaborative. But again, I think that's really important. That uh, not a top-down organization. It's an organization that listens and collaborates and knows that some of the best ideas come from the franchisee community. So true. Mm -hmm. I love it. And it makes everybody, when you feel heard and seen, regardless of what level of the company you're involved in, you're so much more willing to give and participate and be creative. So mm -hmm. I think that is empowering 
to everybody from from the last technician to the owner to the franchisor to everybody don't you think i mean that it sounds like the culture is just very appealing <laughs> it is you're exactly right elizabeth well um we are winding down it's been so great to have you the last question we ask is how can someone get up with you if they are interested in decalage on any level <laughs> oh well that's uh easy i'm on linkedin um i can be reached by phone uh 937-289-4050 or you can email me at rw at decalash.com i'm sorry rw at z sprout z e e s p r o u t dot com great and we will have that in the um show notes as well online um thank you ricky so much i think this has been a great conversation in line with what we love to talk about and celebrate yeah. um and, and I just really appreciate your time. This has been great. Well, thank you so much. I've, uh, I'm, you know, proud to have had the opportunity and uh, honored, actually. So great speaking with both of you. Thank you. Thanks, thank Ricky. You. And we will be right back with Women in Know. Welcome to Women in the Know. This is where we discuss everything from politics and policies, relationships and marketing, from franchise growth, to difficulties between franchise and franchisors. There is nothing limits in women in the know. So what are we going to talk about this, Rebecca? Well, what we didn't get to last week, because we ran out of time. We have so much to talk about, right? Um, but I wanted to address this um, marketing during COVID, which obviously uh, we're dealing with a sensitive topic, but we still want to get our brands out there. We still want to get our messaging out there. So I wanted to talk about that. Great. Well, and, and Michelle Rimple wrote an article in the Franchise Woman about marketing in the time of COVID that had some great tips in it. So you can read it at the franchisewoman.com. But um, one of, I think, the most useful tips in, in a time is, is, is throwing in a little bit of humor. Um, this is not a funny time. <laughs> you have to do it tastefully. But I think being able to laugh at yourself or to laugh at a situation that you're in or to put out some, some humor related to your brand is, is nothing but good. People are going to remember that. They're going to remember that you gave them a chuckle. They're going to remember your name. Um, and I don't think that's used enough. I think people are afraid sometimes to be funny. Um, but I, I think it works. Most people want to be entertained. Even oh. more. I totally agree. I think humor is such a big marketing strategy. Uh, when you're feeling heavy and you're feeling overwhelmed and you're feeling out of control, which most of us, mm -hmm. that's how we're feeling right now with COVID, is I don't have control of the world. I don't have control of this invisible enemy. Uh, so to, to kind of like a, a pressure relief, right? To, to laugh mm -hmm. and, and to see the humor in all of it, whether that is funny masks or crazy stories or going into the future and imagining what life is like living in masks. Or There's got to be a way to take any kind of heavy hearted topic, and COVID is a heavy hearted topic, and give it a beautiful, funny, silly, twist. I'm going to listen to a commercial. I'm going to read an article. Uh, I'm going to listen to a podcast that can, you know, it's somebody that can laugh at themselves or laugh at the situation before I'm going to listen to doom and gloom and to, to heaviness. Humor is a big deal, especially when we're all feeling in pain right now. It really is. And I, um, I do some marketing um, outside of the Franchise Woman, and we did a campaign for a company. And all we had people do was employees send in photos of themselves in their working situations with the pandemic. And there were a lot of cats. Tons, people had tons of cats. It's a cat company. Uh, some dogs uh, sitting in their chairs, standing on their computers. One guy was walking down the hall with a plastic bag over his head, ready for his work day, you know. And it was a huge hit, Not, both internally for the company, but also for the people who were, were engaging with them on social media. Everybody could relate. It was funny, it was light, but it didn't mock anything, you know, and it was, it was, it personalized the, the workers at this company. And I think every, even the high ups got a cut of it. You know, they, they ended up making a whole big video 
of, of funny ways they've been working at home or their kids barging in on meetings or whatever. So I, I think those things work and you remember them and whatever the company is, those things are meaningful. You know, they, they humanize all of us. It does. It reminds me of a commercial uh, that was basically an auto repair shop and mm -hmm. all the auto mechanics were wearing inner tubes, right? These big <laughs> old inner tubes with big old red suspenders holding up the inner tubes. And so here they are working on cars with these big old inner tubes around them, but it kept them inner tube to inner tube apart, which is about six feet right? Mm -hmm. So of course, I'm going to remember that auto repair shop because they knew how to take a difficult situation and add some lightheartedness uh, mm -hmm. to it. But it was a funnier than heck kind of commercial that they had created. Yeah, I, mean, I saw um, another one. I don't know that it was a commercial, but it was in, um, I don't know if it was France or it was somewhere else. And they had new, they had hats with the swim pool, swimming pool noodles on their heads. And that's how they were keeping people socially distant. So oh throwing in something, I mean, I'll, I can picture that picture in my head a second. It's so funny that <laughs> <laughs> you're going to walk around and sit in a restaurant with noodles on your head. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's going to be it's an so experience funny. you remember, right? <laughs> oh, yes. my gosh. It's so funny. And then coming up with new and creative ideas, too, I think that, that may not be humor particular, but my, my sister has a magazine um, that's about a, a visitor's guide in her area. And a relocation guide and what they've started doing is uh, trying to get messaging out for people to talk about what is open for curbside pickup so here's a, a day you could do with your kids this winery has an open green space you can socially distance really easily you can picnic you mm -hmm. can stop by this place and pick up your meal this place and pick up your wine this place and pick up your dessert they're all open here are their hours and then land at this place and have a family picnic and go home so they're doing these virtual tours so I think um, creativity is, is so important in marketing right now and finding ways to get people around your product or your brand or to remember it when they're able to reopen uh, with that kind of creative storytelling um, yeah. works really well. Creativity combined with humor. It's like peanut butter and jelly, right? Uh, sandwiches. <laughs> so <laughs> if you can tell a story creatively and add a twist of humor uh, to it. That's a story I want to hear. I don't care what product, what service you're, you're saying. I want to hear that funny, creative story. I love it. And then remembering that you, you don't want to just stop. Um, Michelle talked about making sure that you, this is a great time to build your presence, to continue growing your Sophia um, engagement and, and to engage with others, support other people's businesses, let other people know where where your opposition is, <laughs> you know, yeah. you can, you can uh, really help each other out during this time and make sure that your, your brand awareness is still strong when you come out the other end of this. And I, you know, hopefully things are starting to open up. So we'll, we'll see who's put in the work and who hasn't. Exactly. I'm excited for that moment. Mm -hmm. I'm in California. Yeah. This whole state is shut down and I'm ready to get out there into our beautiful uh, sun filled country. So yeah. I know I am too. Alabama is starting to open up a little bit, but we are not venturing out too much yet. Mm -mm, mm -mm. <laughs> We're going to wait and see what happens a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Which is causing us to create a lot of creativity and humor in our families and in our home. Otherwise, we would be bored out of our gourd. So, oh, it's so maybe that market. same marketing advice applies to our lives as well as to our businesses. I think it does. You know, my, my son and my niece the other day were cooking macaroni and cheese. She had the recipe and she was giving him a tutorial over FaceTime. And so he's making macaroni and cheese. I was like, what is going on? And so then they start talking about it. We should, we live on, they have a website because they make movies and um, all the nieces and nephews that come in the summer and they are going to now do, I said, y'all should do a video tutorial of your recipes. And they're like, that's a great idea. My niece is like, I'm making a website right now. We're doing it. Joseph, you're in charge of Facebook. You're, so these kids are coming with creative fun projects too, and that will give them something to do over the summer while they're just kind of stuck in limbo, not knowing if they're even going to go to school in the fall. So I, I think it's been an interesting, you know, we'll, we'll have to market their video. <laughs> <laughs> like, I love it. Why, as my son said, they made a movie called Death Trail, and my older son said, he looked at the YouTube channel, and he's like, Mom, 162 unknowing this subjected themselves to this video. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Well, it sounds yeah. like he's got a sense of humor. He does, at the expense of the other one. <laughs> yeah. But it is fun to watch creativity, both in business and in your personal life, because you're just surrounded by people trying to come up with of, of doing things differently. <laughs> yeah, I love it. What a great conversation. I hate to end it, uh, but we do need to go to another break with one of our sponsors. Welcome to Ask Beck and Liz, where no topic is off limits. We want to answer your questions about business, life, and everything in between. But be careful. I may even try to find you a husband or a wife. Just ask Robert Bruschi. I've been doing that recently. So, <laughs> Elizabeth, we always get to have the coolest conversations and they ask uh, Beck and Liz and the questions that we get are always thought provoking. Today's question is, what is the greatest asset that women have in business that men may not possess? Um, that, that's a good question. It's an interesting mm -hmm. question. And I think what, one of the first things that pops into my mind is, I think women tend to use empathy uh, more in general, in, in personal life, but also in business. And I think that we can put ourselves in someone else's shoes. I think that gives us a degree of intuition about reading people, about understanding who they are and what they need um, in order to be successful. If you're the leader of, of a group or if you're the hiring person or if you're the franchisor or you're the agent who's selling, you understand more quickly, I think, and you, and you can get to know someone a little bit better using those tools, using the tool of empathy and using the ability to, to understand who someone is and where they're coming from. Um, mm -hmm. I think we ask questions more like that. I know when I talk to my husband and I'll say, well, how did that person feel about this? And he's like, well, I don't know. I didn't ask him. <laughs> how can you not ask somebody if they've had an event, he had a worker who who had a stressful situation and I said, well, how did he feel? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, you can assume, but I would have said, I'm, I'm so sorry. Are you okay? How do you feel about that? You know, and what can we do there? He's just like, well, here's what we're going to do. Solve it. And that's the end of it. So, I mean, I think that's one of those things women probably do a little bit better and I'm sure it can be a double-edged sword, but in general, I think it's a good quality. I think you're right. It is a, a, a gift that men have where they go straight into the problem solving. This employee had an issue um, where we go straight into the, how did you feel empathy, you know, trying to deal with the heart, uh, issues. And it can be a, a, a double, double edged sword. We can be too empathetic, uh, in certain situations and that could lead to some challenges. Uh, also, you know, it's, it's interesting as we're talking about, uh, empathy. One of the other things that popped up in my head that would probably be a little, more feminine than masculine is humility. I think mm -hmm. women have um, a little more humility than men. Men, you know, wired to achieve and accomplish and compete and build the empires. Uh, so it requires confidence and it requires a, a, a certain, um, you know, bodaciousness to, to them where um, we as women are almost given permission to be more humble um, and we don't have to be as uh, bodacious. And I think it allows us to come across as more authentic and more genuine and to your point, more empathetic and more uh, caring simply because we don't have to pretend we're something or puff ourselves up. We can be more humble, more open to feedback and, and more open to how someone else is thinking and feeling. You know, it's, it's interesting too. I think that can also be a double-edged sword because um, I can't remember where it was from, but there was a study that talked about uh, women's and men's willingness to push forward on something they may not be qualified for. If mm -hmm. a man and woman are equally unqualified for a job, not quite there, the man will just say, oh, I can do that. It's no big deal. And the woman is more likely to say, well, let me get some more training or give me a year. I need to get more experience. Mm -hmm. And so I think sometimes that can hold us back. Mm -hmm. But I think also in terms of uh, age and maturity, um, I probably would have let that hold me back more when I was 30. Yeah. 
And now I realized my friend and I had the year of yes one year. We just said yes to everything, which is actually how I got my book published. Um, because somebody said, oh, I'm a book publisher, I'm, I'm an author, and I have a book, and, and yes, I'll do all these things. And so one thing snowballs from the other, which you can also take too far. But I think uh, as you mature as a woman and become more confident, you don't have to be arrogant. You can still have that humility. I think that we naturally present ourselves more that way, mm -hmm. but also have the confidence not to hold back. Yeah. It really is kind of a, a continuum, <laughs> isn't it? This on mm -hmm. one side is this meek, a timid <laughs> sort of individual that that doesn't uh, have that kind of confidence or willingness to step out of the comfort zone and then there's this other uh, continuum of it that is uh, maybe even a little arrogant or a chip on the <laughs> shoulder but somewhere mm -hmm. in between if, if center is a healthy confidence and at the same time humble not arrogant if that's perfect yeah. then then women are just a little left of this and men are just a little right of that, right? They're a little more mm -hmm. confident than, than we are and a little less humble. And so it can definitely prove to be, if we go too far to one direction where we're too timid and too humble, it can affect our self-esteem and our self-worth. And as you pointed out, even uh, courage. It, it, mm -hmm. it has us holding back from opportunities that may be presenting themselves that we don't feel we're quite ready for. Yeah, and I think we're um, more honest in our self-evaluation. <laughs> like, I, I know my limitations, I know my strengths, but I have learned to say, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. I may not know exactly that thing right this second, but I can either figure it out or I'll find someone else who knows it and I'll ask them. Um, and, and so I think finding balance in all of those traits is, is the challenge and the gift. I mean, at this point, I think it's, it's fun to do it. Yeah. Um, much less intimidating than it used to be. <laughs> but I have a question regarding that, yeah. uh, uh, Elizabeth, because if we're better at self-assessing, does mm -hmm. that then also turn into we're better at asking for help or taking feedback? I mean, if I know I'm not so great at whatever, am I more likely than to ask for advice or feedback simply because I know I'm not so great at that. I think that's a continuum as well, because I think when you're younger, you hate to admit that. Um, <laughs> I think this week I've probably asked you for help, Fred for help, my sister for help. <laughs> like, help! <laughs> I'm not great at graphic design. I know that you're better than me, so I'm gonna ask you for help. You know, I can, I can write something in five minutes that might take somebody else an hour. I don't mind helping with that. So I think that, um, being able to take that feedback and not take it personally, like I totally get what I'm not good at. And if you're going to tell me that, I'm going to be like, yep, you're right. I'm not good at that. So you do it. <laughs> so help me with it. But I, I do think that women are, are pretty good at asking for help and, and delegating, you know, and saying, mm. let's, let's divide this up and get it all done together. And it'll be a much better outcome for all of us if we all put our strengths, you know, forward. Which takes us back to where this conversation started mm -hmm. is uh, by not being arrogant and overly confident and having a certain level of humility and empathy allows us then to tap into the, the strengths and the giftings of other male or female. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter. We're able to recognize the talent in others and recognize the weakness in ourselves and either delegate it or ask for help in, in one way or another. Mm -hmm. we'll and I think, yeah, it is. And when you can appreciate, there's nothing I love more than someone who's really smart or really funny or really creative or just good at what they do or love what they do. And that enthusiasm just permeates from them. So I think being able to appreciate that plays into all of those things. And you start to celebrate someone else's or success or gift and, and choose those people in your life to surround yourself with. So that everything is more robust and more profitable and more um, fun. More fun and we're more connected. We realize right. that we are meant to be in relationship. No human being is mm -hmm. an island. We are meant to have strengths and weaknesses and to rely on one another and to appreciate and respect and be mm -hmm. in awe of your talents or somebody else's talents and vice versa. If we had it all, we knew it all, we'd be 
pretty lonely people, I would think. We would. We would be an island. <laughs> <laughs> Islands, not good. No, Parties, I don't want to be good. an island. Yes. <laughs> Oh, as always, I so love these questions that people send us and ultimately where our thought processes go. And I hope it's helpful for those that are listening. But for now, uh, thank you for joining us today where passion and purpose collide, profits are made and relationships are forged. This is Beck and Liz signing off and wishing you another purpose-filled and profitable week.